Matthew 15, 21 to 28, the faith of the Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that, healed from that very hour. And this is the end in God's word for today. So this week, we will continue our series on Seeking God. And in the past few weeks, we've talked about what it means to hunger after God. We, last week, we talked about what it means to seek God in both the good and difficult times in our lives. And this week, we're going to talk about what it means to seek after the mercy of God. Now, in our world today... We have come to believe that all things should be fair. Often we express that as all things should be equal, right? Everything should be equal for each and every person. Uh, equal is not always fair, um, but what we don't like is when someone gets special treatment for what we deem to be the wrong reason. Sometimes I think we have a point when considering that point of view. For example, we have set up our justice system uh, at least in principle, so that everyone is supposed to be treated the same in the eyes of the law. What is the symbol for our justice system? Does anyone know what it is? Scales? What else? Uh, a blindfolded woman holding the scales, right? Yep, yeah, Lady Justice. So the idea behind that imagery is that all people should be treated the same under the law. She is blindfolded so that she is not influenced by things like what the person looks like or what they may be wearing into court. And she holds the same set of scales for everyone. We are all to be tried under the same rules. That is the principle that we have. All are afforded the same set of allowances by the law. Now again... Remember I said that is the way we have set it up in principle. I think that we can all agree that it doesn't always work that way. Right? And when it doesn't work that way, when it seems that justice is not served in the same way to all, we can get pretty upset by that. See, we believe in a system where the punishment should fit the crime, right? Right? Well, I want to tell you a story this morning, and I want you to think about how you feel as you hear the story. Really think about if this was you that it happened to, how would you be feeling? And as I'm telling you this story this morning, um, there might be a moment as I'm telling it that you may begin to think, where is he going with this? But stick with me, I promise that it has a point to it. There once was a young man that found success in business right out of school. He was a smart and kind person, and he had three really close friends that he trusted with all of his secrets and all of his dreams. Now, in addition to being uh, someone who had a lot of success, he also had the great fortune of being in love, and he was engaged to be married to his one true love, and all things seemed to be going great in his life. Unfortunately for that young man, the three men that he called his friends were actually becoming jealous of all the success and good fortune 
that he seemed to have. One of the men hated him because he was more successful than that man. Another, one of his friends, was jealous of his love and wanted the man's future bride for himself. And the third of his friends was simply jealous because he thought that young man was just luckier in his life than he was. The three men got together and they decided to hatch a secret plan to have the young man arrested. And on the day of his wedding, they planted evidence on him to make it look like he was planning to overthrow the government. The young man was arrested and thrown into prison under these false charges. But while he was in prison, he became friends with his sailmate, with, uh, um, who was an older man. And the older man told him about a treasure that he had hidden. And his cellmate also taught the young man how to become a gentleman in society. And when his cellmate dies, he leaves the treasure to the young man, telling him where to find it. The young man then escapes from prison, gathers the treasure, and spends the next ten years planning his revenge on the three men that had sent him to prison. And after those ten years is up, he is ready to spring his plan into action. He has set it up so that he will bankrupt each and every one of them and so that their crimes against him and others will come to light. He has spent every day of those ten years planning his great revenge against them. Every moment in his life has led up to this chance to destroy his enemies. It's all it's been his all-consuming thought since he was sent to prison. And now is the time to strike. And he decides instead to show them mercy. He decides to forgive them. He decides instead of having them all arrested, he's going to be kind to them and allow them to continue living their lives. How does that ending of the story make you feel? Is Better? Did you think that's where the story was going? Well, really, that's, that ending to that story seems wrong, right? It seems like if he had taken all that time and put in all that effort, and he was truly wronged by these people, he should have taken his revenge. Now, if you take out the ending part there where he decides to show mercy on them, does anyone recognize this story? It is. It is the Count of Monte Cristo, which, of course... In the actual story, he does take his revenge. And that's my way of, of doing a short and possibly terrible retelling of the classic story by Alexander Dumas. With that big exception, like I said, in the book, um, in the countless movies that have been made uh, about the book, he does take his revenge on those that had sent him to prison. So why would I change the ending this morning to talk to you all? Do I believe that I'm a better writer than Alexander Dumas? No, absolutely not. He's one of the great writers in history. I changed the ending today to illustrate a point, and it is this. And when you hear that ending about the Count showing mercy, instead of taking his revenge, it does, it feels wrong, doesn't it? Those guys didn't deserve mercy. They cheated, they lied, they stole. They essentially tried to get him uh, really killed. And they should have gotten their, gotten their just desserts in the end. But the thing about mercy is, when it is given to someone that we don't think is worthy of it, it can be upsetting to us. Now in our scripture for today, we find a Canaanite woman coming to Jesus, seeking healing for her daughter. Now this woman is one that if you were one of uh, a, a Jewish disciple following Jesus, you would simply think, this woman is not worthy of the mercy of God. She is a part of the people that we have been fighting against since our people came into this land. Send her away, Jesus. She is not worthy. And when she asked Jesus for the mercy for her daughter, for the healing for her daughter, even Jesus tells her, I am not here for your people. I am here for my people, the children of Israel. It would not be right for me to heal your daughter because it takes away from what I am doing for my people. But the woman continues to press him, essentially saying to him, I know, 
I am not worthy of your mercy. But I still believe that you can heal my daughter. And Jesus praises her for her faith and her daughter is healed. If there's one thing that I have found in in reading scripture, Jesus loves someone who's persistent. There are stories upon stories of ones that come to him and are turned away by others, or even in this case, essentially turned away by Jesus himself, but still they persist. But if you were one of his disciples, and he heals this woman's daughter, how do you feel? Do you wonder at the power of him healing the daughter? Do you admire the faith of the woman that came to him, even though she knew she wasn't worthy? Or do you think to yourself, why would you help her? Why would you show mercy on our enemies? Again, when it comes to the mercy that God shows to people, we struggle when it's given to those that we don't think are worthy. But how do we feel when it's given to us? We like that, don't we? When God shows his mercy to us. But you might be saying, but pastor, we are really mostly good people. We don't sin the way that those other people do. Surely we are more worthy of God's mercy, right? No. We are not more worthy of his mercy than those that we would deem as others. And notice that I said, we Because I am not more worthy of his mercy than anyone else in this world. But the wonderful news is that he gives it to us and to them freely. Fairness doesn't enter into it at all. He gives his mercy through Jesus because of his love for us. So what does that mean for us that are seeking after God, seeking after what it is that God would have have us do? Well, to me, it's pretty clear it means that we need to be a merciful people. Ones that do not hold the sins of the past of people against them. If we're truly seeking after God and what he wants, then we must be willing to forgive others. We must be willing to look past their failings, especially in the past, and be willing to offer them mercy even if we don't think they deserve it. And I know that is hard. And I know that it doesn't seem fair. Because somehow in this world we've come to believe that what is fair is right. And maybe in this world that is the best we can hope for. But as followers of Christ, we are held to a higher standard than just fairness. We are held to the standard of mercy. What does Christ tell us about our enemies? What are we to do for them? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus says this, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good for them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Sounds an awful lot like showing mercy especially to those that don't deserve it. Now, I think sometimes we struggle with showing mercy to others because we try to do it all on our own. And in our humanness, that makes it so hard for us to do. And when we find that we are struggling with showing mercy to others, especially those that have wronged us, instead of trying to do it all on our own, I would encourage you to pray. Lord, I am struggling. I am struggling to show that person mercy and kindness, the same that you have shown me. Lord, please be with me and help me to love them the way that you do. You know, sometimes we forget that we don't have to do it all on our own. That in seeking God and seeking what God wants us to be doing, it is okay for us to go to God and ask him for help to do the things that are difficult for us to do. And indeed, I believe that is the key to seeking God. See, we should be coming to him in all things. We should be asking ourselves what he would want us to do in in a given situation. 
And we should be asking him what we should be doing in that situation. When I think of that, I'm always reminded of Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. See, it is reminding us that we are to seek God's understanding in all we do. And if we can do that, we can begin to understand how it is possible to show mercy to others, especially those that we don't think deserve it, in the same way that God has shown mercy to us when we don't deserve it. My challenge for you this week is this. Is there someone in your life that you've been denying mercy to? Contact them this week and let them know they are forgiven. Amen.